Vaseline. So what's the topic for this week, Kara? Well, today's topic is what we think deaf interpreting means. Right, right. And it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big topic mm-hmm. in our world at the moment, a hot topic, I would say. We're getting more of an opportunity to work with deaf interpreters in Ireland. I know other countries, the profession is much stronger, but mm-hmm. here I think it's still growing. That's true. We are seeing it a lot more often. And today we have a very special guest with very us. Very special. The wonderful Teresa Lynch is joining us on the meme to talk about what she thinks deaf interpreting is. She's also deaf herself, so that adds an interesting perspective. Yeah, she's a deaf interpreter who, I think she's completed her training in America. And I think her working languages are Irish Sign Language, American Sign Language, and International Sign. I think, but she'll confirm that later. Yeah, she'll be able to tell us more about it. But first, Romy, what do we think deaf interpreting is? So do you want to take it away? Uh, Really, for me, um, my idea of what deaf interpreting is. Now, I don't have a lot of experience of working with a deaf interpreter, but I suppose my kind of perspective of when a deaf interpreter would be used or needed would be, um, you know, it's when a greater a, a greater understanding of linguistics and language and culture is needed. You know, mm. I wouldn't have those skills mm. necessarily as a hearing interpreter. Mm. I don't have that life experience of growing up deaf, whereas a deaf interpreter has that. That's innate to them and they live in a, a visual Absolutely. world and they're able to make things much more visual than I possibly ever could to make sure that someone could understand. And it's really, I wouldn't have access to that experience, mm. but that experience is needed to make sure something is interpreted as clearly as possible really it would be impossible for me to to actually be able to do that because i didn't grow up deaf myself that's it, that's it and i agree with you 100 percent um with my perspective of deaf interpreting i know that there are different kinds of roles as a deaf interpreter so you could be a deaf interpreter who works between two sign languages like for example Teresa lynch would work between american sign language and irish sign language because mm-hmm. those are her two working languages so she would watch one sign language and produce in the other sign language. I know another one is relay deaf interpreting, which would be, for example, if I, I as a hearing person were to turn up to a court and be working with a deaf client, like I'm interpreting from English into Irish sign language, but I feel like maybe the deaf individual isn't understanding me. Maybe my language production isn't good enough or they don't understand the situation or maybe they're foreign, right? And they have different language background. I'm not the right fit for that situation. It should be a deaf interpreter who's brought in for that because they would have the experience and ability to yeah, handle it. Yeah, especially for a serious situation. Like, for example, a courtroom, Absolutely. you know, that's legal. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So, like, it's make, you need to make sure someone understands that information. There, yeah. there can't be kind of a vague or grey area there. Could you imagine if I was interpreting and ignored the fact that they didn't understand my brand of ISL, right? The results for them, like the mm. impact on their life of not understanding what's going on could yeah. result in them going to prison. Like, it's a serious situation. So that's what my understanding of deaf interpreting is. Do you, have you worked with a deaf interpreter before? Um, I have one experience of working with a deaf interpreter. Actually, I was working with you at the same time. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I forgot about that. We had a deaf interpreter there translating from Irish Sign Language to International Sign. And it was quite an interesting experience. Um, I think I was much more aware of my own interpretation yeah, exactly. through it. Yeah, yeah. You know, because they were depending on what I was producing to be able to relay that into International Sign. Yeah, that job, that job was quite interesting because they were new as a working interpreter they knew I know international line I know I know ISL and we didn't have the opportunity to have a conversation with the deaf interpreter on how to work with them and I think that was a missed opportunity for us as a team because we didn't have that conversation Mm. as to how we work together and that's what we should have done and I felt it was a pity that we didn't take advantage and didn't have that conversation on how we can work as best as a team yeah yeah, and I think the fact that there is more opportunities now to work with deaf interpreters. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. because of course there's so many more people living in Ireland that possibly ISL is not their first language. Or um, as well, I think people are more, you know, more aware that a deaf and hearing interpreter need to be used together Absolutely, as a team. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so there definitely are more instances in that it's, it's used now. But still not enough. And there's very little training for us as hearing interpreters as to how to work with deaf interpreters. And there's not much training for deaf interpreters themselves. It's more a situation like maybe if I know in advance that there's a deaf interpreter who will be there, I will meet them in advance so we can figure out how to work together as a team Mm -hmm. because there is none of that training. And we did talk about that with team interpreting, right? That you need to converse on how to work as a team. But it's rare we work with deaf interpreters to begin with. But Mm -hmm. if it ever happens, we should have a conversation beforehand on how to work as a team because it's... Not a case where you can arrive and make it work. Maybe I'm wrong yeah. in saying that. But that's yeah, just I, what think I think exactly it's part of that f- 
like forward planning and making sure everyone's aware of the process yeah. because you know it's it's a different process than you'd be used to kind of maybe in your everyday interpreting life and yeah. you know yeah. um, it's brilliant that deaf interpreters are being used in more situations and if you are in a particular situation it's great that a deaf interpreter is there but you need to make sure you have that open communication to know what exactly your role is and how your best you're going to work together yeah it's, good. it's true and it's, it's funny when we're talking about the role of interpreters whether they be hearing or deaf I know there's a paper that uh, is going to be published soon about how deaf interpreters like this is research I've done about how deaf interpreters get a job well really it's a situation where a hearing interpreter goes in assesses the situation mm. then realizes there's a need, yeah, for a need for a deaf interpreter but like I there. said before there needs to be awareness right and I think you have to yeah. be self-aware mm. around situations about the ability do I have the ability to do this job Am I best for this job or I'm not? Exactly. Like that self-awareness is essential. I think as well, um, before we were talking about kind of like ego. Yeah. And you need to remember it's not about yourself. It's about who you're interpreting for. That's it, you know, yeah. and I think uh, what is the best for that situation? You know, not just yourself. What's the best for that situation? Absolutely. Like, do yeah, I actually yeah. have the skills? You know, can I actually interpret this or not? You know, and, you know, maybe I should you know discuss with someone else to you know with or maybe there should be someone who has more experience or well the knowledge in that area or there needs to be a deaf interpreter brought in or even ask you the deaf interpreter what do you think exactly it's yeah. simple yeah it's simple but you know we're new interpreters in the mm -hmm. scheme of things right we we're graduating at the same time but when we left okay no we had a little bit of training as to what a deaf interpreter yeah. is but when we hit the real world I never think of when we should use it. It's only when you like go to a job, realize, oh, mm. I'm not the right person. And then we get a deaf interpreter. Um, <laughs> there's often this situation when you're a recently graduated interpreter, you don't realize that you're not the best fit for a job. Mm. And that's enough on your plate without like, I don't know. I don't know. It's like trying to think how to know when you need a deaf interpreter. Yeah. I think that's a big question. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes... Um, Sometimes when you're interpreting, you kind of find there is a deaf interpreter present, but not in a formal sense, if that makes sense. Yeah, Say, for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you're interpreting for, like, a, a group of, of deaf um, people. And I just know myself, just from an experience that I had, I was interpreting on a training course, and there was um, a few deaf people there that were on the course. And, you know, there was a lot of very technical knowledge and information that was being used throughout the course, and, like, language that you'd need to specifically, to specifically know, and that was quite technical. Mm. So we went through, we are going through um, the days, you know, and... Um, there was actually yeah, one of the one of the deaf attendees you know they knew a lot about the topic and a lot about the background to it and had a lot of experience so they would kind of sort of take in the, the interpretation if that makes sense and then relay it in a much more clear and visual way to the other um, attendees on the course to really make sure that they understood and you know it's important to remember that we are skilled in our language uh, as our sign language interpreters but this is our second language. If we look at the common European framework of reference, it's got like different tiers, like mm -hmm. A1, A2, A3, whatever. So A1 is like, you've just started learning a language and you have basic skill in it. We become, I think the top two tiers are C1 and C2. So C2 means it's your first language. Like, yeah. so for me, my first language is English. You too, right, Kira? Mm -hmm. um, so for us, we learn sign language as a second language is what I basically am trying to get to say. So it's nearly impossible to become native in how we use the language there's this part this essence of it that we'll never be yeah. able to yeah, know it's the, i suppose it's the cultural part you right know, we study deaf studies and we study deaf culture but at the same time you know we haven't been brought up deaf it's exactly. you know it's not our lived experience exactly you know no, it's exactly that and i think that's a beautiful way to put it as well yeah yeah you know i, I worked with the a deaf interpreter i've worked with them a few times actually but always in conference settings so one of the first times I worked with a deaf interpreter, they were amazingly highly skilled. They've been trained, like they have a degree in it. And that was such a smooth, that was smooth. It was so easy working. We arrived early. Well, I arrived early. We were flying into this conference, right? Mm -hmm. So I flied early and it was perfect. I mean, I think the conference was due to start at nine and I was there at eight. And we were able to have that conversation advance. Like, how, how do I do this? How do I work with a deaf interpreter? Like, if I am suddenly working into English, how do you support me? How do mm -hmm. I support you? It was yeah. a beautiful conversation. And it was really important that mm -hmm. both of us were open in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Like, if I am interpreting, she could interrupt me right because mm -hmm. what was happening let's say I was going into English she would have her hearing interpreter who would feed her from Danish sign language so she was Danish um 
and her hearing interpreter would monitor me to make sure I was on track and she could interrupt me if I was off and it was beautiful it worked really well yeah yeah that's interesting because when we were talking about like teamwork and team interpreting you know it's so important to have open communication absolutely you know and not be afraid to actually say something to actually be able to support each other fully and it's the same like she was able to interrupt me and tell me if I was wrong but similarly if she went off which never happened in the job like she was beautiful (laughs) really stunning work but if she had gone off I was able to if it ever came up she was open that I could be like hey actually this is what they mean and I asked her you know should I should I interrupt your feed interpreter or you and she's like no come directly to me you know yeah it was just beautiful yeah but that's because the trust was there you oh know, you totally. had the fundamental trust was there we trusted each other because of our skill like I had some experience <laughs> she had so much more experience <laughs> but but still there was definite trust there between the two of us there was no power dynamic either like there was no egos were at the door you know it was just okay just focus on the whole situation absolutely and think of okay our audience how is the best we can produce our product for the audience yeah yeah i think as well when we think about deaf interpreting you know sometimes it's not a formal situation if you get me yeah sometimes um depending on who you're interpreting for say for example it's a group like friends or something um or just depending i suppose on the generation Mm. you know um, I'm trying to think. I was interpreting something. I can't remember. Was it an education or? Anyway, I was like an information evening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, there was it was actually a group of young deaf people, and there was one um one of the participants in particular, like they had it. They were a deaf interpreter. <laughs> they truly were, you know. And because the class was quite um quite young, so I didn't know if they were, they were unsure, really yeah. kind of getting the information that I was giving them, but they took that and were able to transform that into a much more visual kind of way that they completely understand. Again, because of that same lived experience, the same age as well. Um, And, you know, peers. Yeah, yeah. among peers, exactly. So she knew exactly how that would be understood by the others. I think we can learn a lot as hearing interpreters from our deaf interpreter colleagues. definitely. Because we do have our role to also foster and promote deaf interpreters with them. Not not like, we need them, la la la, and talk on their behalf. We're a team, right? so important. Yeah, Yeah, I know, and it should be. And I think we have that responsibility at the moment I think it's a little bit I mean there's few interpreters to begin with in Ireland I think at the moment there's seven deaf interpreters and if they want to work there's very few opportunity for them to work and I think we need to review how we can encourage and foster the profession and improve it for everyone and I think as well as well it's so important to actually watch a deaf interpreter but I know you were saying there's so few opportunities to actually see that Mm. you know um you know but for say for example deaf interpreters for or working with people who um who moved to Ireland and ISL is not their first language and you English may not be one of their, their languages so you can't depend on finger spelling or anything like you At really all. have to change to a much more visual way visual. of and interpreting really and I think that's why it's so important to watch a deaf interpreter and how they work and how they translate and make everything so visual and so clear to understand and it's an innate skill and I think we can learn a lot from each other right but we need more training in Ireland I believe yeah definitely. with deaf interpreters and like and not uh, one training session where you know deaf and hearing interpreters yeah. together I how to work together and when to use one a few years ago i think it was 2007 yeah it wasn't like super recent it was a while ago like for us as new interpreters who are out we wouldn't have had any uh, we we did have classes with Teresa lynch yeah. as our lecturer before right and we did talk a little bit about deaf interpreting however i think we do need a more in-depth workshop like with role plays where you're working with a deaf interpreter and not just one deaf interpreter, a few deaf interpreters that we have in Ireland mm-hmm. and create various teams and dynamics. And I think that's important yeah, exactly. that we do and that. Yeah, how, exactly. how you're going to work together going exactly. forward. You know, and there needs to be that kind of professional relationship there and working together. Between the both of us, yeah. I know times are changing at the moment um, now that we've had the ISL Act ratified as of 2017 yeah, 2017. and they're preparing for the implementation of it this year 2020 yeah, in december year, yeah. right so with this time changing and there's no register of interpreters at the moment not yet that's true <laughs> not yet it's it's being worked on it's a work in progress um but it, there needs to be deaf interpreters on this register as well and they don't necessarily have the same training background as us because of the situation in ireland and i really feel now is a perfect time for us to really get closer with our deaf interpreter and colleagues, right? Um, and I think we need to have more conversation and more awareness mm-hmm. around general interpreting and the need for a deaf interpreter, right? Because it, there's a lot going on with this establishment of a register, but I think us on the ground 
we may not know what a deaf interpreter yeah. is and how to use one yeah. or and what does creating even, yeah. the register or what it's going to look do like know. exactly no and that's it and like i have worked with a deaf interpreter in a conference not in ireland but I, it has happened and many hearing interpreters may not even consider bringing in a deaf interpreter mm. in that associate in that situation so i think we need more awareness and i'm sure Teresa lynch will I tell us so more i should have her on <laughs> Oh, she knows so much. She has so many skills. Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. I think that might be the perfect segue Great. to bring her on. It's the perfect time to invite on our Come. next guest. Come on, Teresa Lynch. Yeah. Great. So we have the wonderful Teresa Lynch. Her sign name is Teresa or Teresa. You're right. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. I do prefer the Irish version ah. of my sign name, but... The community do use the American handbook. So she is a deaf woman, a mother of two. She's a working deaf interpreter, plus she also works in the Centre for Deaf Studies under Trinity College Dublin as an assistant lecturer and professor. She writes numerous articles uh, about deaf interpreting and team interpreting. So we are so delighted to have her here on the podcast to talk <laughs> so about deaf interpreting. Uh, oh, now, we go. who have we got? Who have we got? Our special guest here. <laughs> Teresa, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much How for coming. How are you feeling? Nervous. Nervous. I know this is going to be public. And yeah. so normally we'd be sitting having a conversation. You could talk about anything. Whereas now I kind of feel a yeah. bit stiff. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, oh, it's not like that part. No, we were the same. We have the same experience before. We're really happy to have you here. So welcome Great. to the lean. Thank you. Thank you. So I love your sign for the lean. Really, just shows the 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 team interpreting aspect of yeah, it. It's gorgeous. You, Cormac is the one who created it because when Kieran yeah. and I came to him before, we were like, oh, you know, we're making a podcast. Um, we don't have a sign or anything, but the name at the moment is the Lean, and Cormac was like, oh, the, the Lean. lean. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. Really good. So, yeah, really it's beautiful. Good. It's yeah. nice. It's nice. Okay, shall we get going Please now? Do. Um, we're going to start off with our first question. Um. If you'd be able to just describe a little bit about your background and your interpreting experience so far. I mean, to be honest, if we were to talk about that, we could be here all weekend. <laughs> uh, trying to narrow that down into it's 20 minutes difficult. in relation to my experience and my background. I'll do my best. I've grown up deaf. Um, I think it's important for me to mention I come from a hearing family. I have three hearing sisters and one deaf brother, Brian Lynch, you may know him. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Naturally, uh, as a family, my family were really good. I was very fortunate in the sense that we had great communication. My mom and dad were good. You know, they tried their best. Um, My three sisters, if they weren't at home and mom and dad were having a conversation about, you know, the goings on in the news, I would lip read. And remember now, I was quite young. And oftentimes, my brother would look to me to say, hey, what are they saying? And I was able to pick that up. I was able to lip read what it was that they were saying. Um, and obviously, you know, taking that English and being able to translate that into <laughs> Even if friends came to my house, say, for example. Um, and obviously, they would be deaf friends of mine and would have attended oral school. And the teachers, you know, would have known that they had great speech or would have said that they had great speech and would have been used to their way. Whereas other people might be taken aback and not quite understand. Mm. Um, They would probably start talking to my mom and dad in a deaf voice as such. They knew mine, but they didn't know theirs. And equally, if I was to go to their house, their parents wouldn't understand me. So we often interpreted for each other, each other. And again, this was without training. It was, it was a sense of kind of relay of interpreting. Yeah. And it was something that was just part of my life growing up for years. Even within school and in our classroom, I'd have to lip read the teacher or potentially there'd be information written on the board in English. I would try and kind of take that in. And within the class, we would interpret for each other. And oftentimes when the teacher would look at me, we would just stop. Mm, you weren't allowed to sign at that time, right? Right. Yes, it was an oralist system within the school. And so the teachers would put the information up on the board in English and we would obviously then, you know, kind of code switch and put that into Irish sign language. And to be honest, I think mm. all, well, like, let me go back, maybe not all, but most yeah. deaf people would have that skill in terms of navigating between two languages and two cultures. I think that's something that's really inherent to our experience. I think the most important thing to remember for me, I remember when I just left school and I had met an old, should I say old, uh, young? Uh, Older, maybe? Older, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's not the right context in how I use that, that, that term. But yes, older. And their language style would be would have been very different. And, mm. you know, I really wanted to, to get this man and understand what it is that he had to say. 
Um, I do, I think it was at the IDS AGM, um, where he came up to make a comment and the audience were, uh, uh, they, did, they didn't know what he had to say. Yeah, Whereas I yeah. knew him, I'd met with him and he mm-hmm. lived near my home. So when he got up to make his point, instinctively I got up onto the stage to relay what it was that he wow, was saying yeah. um, and if this is an experience that I have had throughout mm-hmm. my life in terms of doing that so just for people who don't know what the IDS is of course Irish Deaf Society yeah, you're right to Thanks. mention that yes, yes for our international deaf-led viewers um, <laughs> deaf led organisation right. which is important to mention who would campaign for the rights of deaf people and ensuring equality of access yeah. gosh I'm just thinking it must have been hard maybe for you to stand up there how did you feel no. doing it I think it was an instinctive thing. It That's was something funny. that I really wanted to ensure that everybody else got to see what this man had to say. He had yeah. some valuable input and I could see that people weren't understanding him and it was just an instinctive thing to, to just get up and do it. Yeah, so just lovely. to relay that information and it's such a satisfying feeling. Remember this remember think about the frustration of this particular man he's communicating sure. with other deaf people and because of the educational experience that led to certain barriers well, that must yeah. be tough wow yeah i suppose it's a it's an experience it's a I suppose that experience that's yes, very much it's part innate. of you it's <laughs> innate, exactly you don't even realize that it's something that you're doing until i moved to america i lived there for about seven years and I had a fantastic opportunity oh, to engage amazing. in some training. The first deaf training that was established in America was very, very lucky. We were in Washington, D.C. in Maryland oh, yeah. under uh, the tuition of MJB Avenue mm-hmm. and Betty Colonomus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but both of them were highly skilled um, and were involved in training the interpreters. And they established this first Gosh. initial uh, training uh, program for deaf interpreters. The centre was called the Bicultural Centre. Oh, yeah. I mean, really, you know, kind of rooted in, uh, you know, a deaf independent centre. And I was so fortunate wow. to have that experience Amazing. and to have that tuition. And from that, I suppose it really helped me to relate to my experience that I really didn't realise I had. I became more confident. Equally, I learned skills in relation to confidentiality and boundaries and just the sheer importance of that. Do you think most deaf interpreters have had the same experience as you? Yes, do you think that's yes, possible? Yes, I do. I do. I think many, many have had that experience. But I suppose the difference is I put myself forward for this job. Right. I chose this job. Right. Other people would absolutely have the ability, but it's just not their taste. It's not their choice. For me, I would have been involved in different committees or uh, I would be involved in uh, you know, explaining written documents in English. Yeah, but just kind of a natural, natural thing that you, you always do. I don't even know what that is. It's that, it's that you know, know dare I say kind of soft skills navigating your way between language and understanding nuances within the Mm. deaf community and how to communicate that message and it's just something that you instinctively know and you instinctively have you have that ability it's like I say a soft skill but again this is a choice and some don't want to be deaf interpreters okay so that kind of leads on to our next question of what do you think deaf interpreting is the list is endless Obviously, uh, you know, when you think about deaf people who come from different countries like, say, Russia or Japan or Africa, and when they arrive in Ireland, they need that, you know, access or say, for example, uh, a Japanese deaf person who arrives in Ireland on holiday and an incident takes place where they're in need of access. Now, again, you need to work with a hearing Mm. interpreter. You couldn't do the job without a hearing interpreter. That's really important to mention. And again, then I would translate that information into international sign language in a very visual way Mm. Um, or potentially people who move to Ireland and uh, they need to attend a police station or Mm. a a visa uh, office or to get a license for something. And equally, then I can find myself in situations where I'm interpreting for deaf blind, which I'll talk about a little bit later earlier on. Or potentially a relay aspect of okay. interpreting in the sense that you would have somebody come from America. I was quite lucky yeah. that I lived in America for seven years, would have an understanding and a familiarity with ASL. And so I would then relay that information from ASL into Irish Sign mm. Language. Again, you're essentially changing vocabulary, but the structure of the language is quite similar. Um, I 
think for some deaf people, equally another aspect of my work would be when deaf people are living in isolation. Okay. Language mm-hmm. needs mm-hmm. contact and without mm-hmm. that contact, language diminishes and therefore they're living in isolation and they're not exposed to everyday conversation. That's quite impactful when you think about the level of access that they would need and the interpretation that they would need in order for understanding to take place Mm -hmm. and so for me when I think about the linguistic aspects of the language and interpretation and understanding and language usage between different members of the community and their cultural Mm -hmm. experience again having those soft skills in order to be able to really understand how to engage with them you have some interpreters who have a fantastic skill set they're qualified they have a degree in mm. interpreting right. but for working with specific yeah. pur- people you do need to but have it's the presence being a little of a bit deaf like interpreter. a link that Absolutely. missing link being present yes so Absolutely. interesting and um, so just a question sorry. that's actually just come to my mind um when we're talking about hearing interpreters you know you often find that they have their specific kind of skill set or specialist areas they like to work in i'm just wondering for deaf interpreters is that something that they would work in a specific area or mm. would they be more kind of working in general areas or do a little bit I of everything it's a different skill Obviously, when we think about our everyday life, somebody attending university or a job interview, mm. that level of understanding and, and, and the need for one interpreter works very, very well. The information is, is, is brought across clearly. There's no, uh, there's very clear boundaries there within, mm. within the interpretation. I think that's, a, you know what I mean, a really good, inter- hearing interpreters have a, a really good skill in terms mm. of navigating their way through that communication, whereas deaf people don't really have the opportunity to engage in those kind of, of, of systems and the hearing interpreter is able to navigate their way through those cultural differences and, and gaps. Uh, when a deaf person walks into the room you have that shared experience all you have to do is look at each other and their comfort takes Mm, over I'm not talking about taking over the room I always remember you know I mean the first time after two minutes uh, when I had done my first deaf interpreting job the comfort was there after two minutes we Mm, had that shared experience that shared understanding that shared culture um, that really uh, you know kind of helps to develop that relationship and once we have those kind of shared experiences or even just nuances, sometimes eye gaze in relation to our experience, when a question is asked, we're able to respond to that. Whereas a hearing interpreter wouldn't have that mm. sh- same shared experience. Mm. And it's so important building exactly. that rapport as well. Exactly. And that level of comfort and ensuring that access happens for them. It's interesting. We take years to build that yeah. rapport with yeah, yes. exactly. the deaf community, but you have yeah. it there. Exactly. exactly. You have it there. Yes. Gosh, yes. it's so interesting. Yes. But the important thing to remember is teamwork. I 100% agree with this. Working alongside each other is crucial. If whoever it is that you're working with decide to just jump out in front and take the lead, that's where (laughs) communication breaks down. There's no relationship. You're not understanding who and what is going on. And this isn't only Mm. deaf people. Mm. This is hearing people, whether you be working with different professionals, a psychologist, the guards, Mm. a detective, whatever it may be. (laughs) It's really important that they view the interpreting team as a team. Mm. That's really, really important. There's no power imbalance there whatsoever. Mm. You are working together as a team. Actually, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, you as a deaf individual from the deaf community how do you know mm. the boundaries because it's got to be a bit it's more true. difficult when you're a part of the deaf community as a hearing mm-hmm. person we have this privilege almost that mm. we can go home at night and take that hat off but you are a part of the community and it's a different dynamic That's so an how interesting question. Yeah. um i think deaf people are gifted in that sense Straight away, you have uh, an affinity with that person. You, your aim is to ensure their their comfort with your presence in the room. Mm. We have ha- have that, like I said, a shared experience, and that trust then is 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 built. Um, you know what I mean on a stage by stage basis. So, um, if I attend a workshop or if I bump into somebody on the street, and this has happened to me on occasions, yeah. I remember one time uh, being in a supermarket with my husband. And I bumped into somebody who I had worked with and we began to chat. And my husband queried, who is that person? And I was thinking, do you know, I met them somewhere. Can't we? But the person who's seen me explain that that way is so relieved. They know Mm. straight away that that trust is maintained. And going forward, they can maintain that comfort. So regardless of whether I meet them, 
they're going to understand my boundaries and will understand that they can trust me. Yeah. And it's about how we convey that. Oh, I think I met them such and such somewhere doing something. We do need to understand the importance of confidentiality and boundaries, mm. but it is something that we would inherently know to keep. It's fascinating how there that difference is there. Yeah, yes, it's interesting. Yes. But I, I do want to go back to something that you just mentioned there previously that, you know, you had that privilege of being able to say good luck and finish yeah. work after nine to five. I don't know that that's enough. I think it's really that's crucial true. So that true. interpreters so maintain true. their involvement in the community. That's how trust is built. That's how you learn to keep those boundaries. Absolutely. It's really, really important that hearing interpreters are involved in the community. Obviously, deaf people are all the time. But I think it's a pity because many interpreters, many hearing interpreters are not involved in the community. Yeah. And that's a real shame. I yeah. feel quite strongly about that. Mm. You know, I think it's important for us as interpreters to remember that we can't work from nine to five no. and yes. just let yes. go of everything altogether. It's impossible. Interestingly, just yesterday I had received a text from a friend of mine. And this happens to me quite often, to be honest, where I'll be asked questions in relation to specific interpreters and they will ask if they're if they're good or bad, if they're oh. you know, good or bad. Oh, okay. And this happens to me wow. quite often. You know, so let's say, for example, if I was to use yourself and I'm not trying to pick at you, but if I was <laughs> to say something like, away. you know, Romy, is, is Romy good? Do you know who she is? And some people respond by saying, I don't know who she is. Mm. That's a real problem mm. because they don't know the interpreters in the community and therefore how do they gain that comfort? And people uh -huh. often ask me that question. Yeah. And that's why it's so important when trust. we talk about trust. Absolutely. So important and equally understanding how to maintain those boundaries while still being involved in the community. And I also think those boundaries depend on whether you're working in yes. that situation as an interpreter or you're out, mm -hmm. you're having a coffee, a oh, chat absolutely. with your mate, you know, you could still mm. have those boundaries in specific absolutely. settings, right? I think people are familiar with that. Yeah. They understand that. Okay, some maybe are not familiar, but they learn as they go along. So They true. learn as they work with you. Mm. It isn't a case of nine to five, I'm done, see you later, and yeah. you're hiding from the community yeah. just doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. Okay, we're going to move on to our next question. Is there any experience that really sticks out in your mind or something that really gives us a great example of what deaf interpreting is to you? Mm, again, the list is endless. <laughs> and I'm trying to think which one do I want to share with you in terms of how much impact it's had. Or um, I've had some really gorgeous experiences and then I've had some experiences that have been quite difficult, to be mm. honest, and have mm. um, been unsure as to, okay. you know, how to how to deal with. So I'll give you one of each. Great. Um, one that comes to mind, like, say, for example, we're all in school. You know, if you think about the, the example of, of a deaf school, St. Joseph's School and St. Mary's mm. School, and, you know, all of the teachers would have had sign names mm. and you would have had the nuns and the Christian brothers say, and they all have their own kind of individual sign names. And I remember being booked to work um, on a job in a you know kind of rural part of the country, mm. and there was a deaf person who was in a wheelchair, had limited movement, okay. and very limited signing ability, but mm. powerful facial expressions that was really able to mm. convey what 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 they what they wanted to say, <laughs> and they were asking a question in relation to school and memories about their time in school and had mm. asked specifically about a, a teacher and let's say for example if we want to you know <laughs> sign names i'm not going to obviously mention the person that i'm actually talking about okay. just for confidentiality reasons but sure. let's say we'll go with this sign name where they've got one on the chin one on the nose and one on the ear mm. and um there were three different sign names for three different teachers that were quite similar and when asked the question to this deaf individual about their time in school you could see they wanted to respond and they were using the sign but it wasn't on the face it was down on the hands Gosh. again like i said limited movement and so i was yeah. thinking okay i know they're talking about a teacher in the school naturally a hearing interpreter is not gonna have a clue, no, have a clue. of not what no that shame. experience is they've never been in a deaf school mm -hmm. and so when when i questioned was it this person on the chin or this person on the nose finally got to the sign on the ear and it was like their facial expression changed straight Gosh. away and it really gave me goosebumps wow. to be honest because of that ability that communication ability is still there yeah. but it's about how we convey the message in order to be able to gain understanding mm. 
and and that's a lived shared experience and something that wow. really has made an impact and that's because of knowledge because of background knowledge because of that lived experience within the community that we know who it is and what it is that we're talking yeah. about and something that's really easy to identify for us as deaf interpreters like I said, I've grown up in the community. I have a deaf brother. I've been to deaf school. I've, you know, grown up in the deaf community. Very rarely would I have had communication or opportunity to chat with deaf blind people. Now, I will say I thought that I or do think that I'm a good interpreter. I think I possess those soft skills that are needed for communication. I remember being in a situation, I think it was in a church, where somebody said, hey, Tracy, you're a deaf interpreter. Could you interpret for this particular person who was deaf blind? And this was a long time ago, and I was quite confident and quite assertive. I felt like I knew what I was doing, mm -hmm. felt like I could do a good job. And after the job had finished, the deaf blind individual told me that I needed to go for training. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, well, okay. But it really had an impact on me because deaf interpreters don't know everything. And it really hit me, took me aback, and I thought, you know what, you are, you're right. I do need to learn more about how to communicate in this mm -hmm. way. I need to engage with deafblind people a lot more. I need to really build up on my, um, on my skills. I remember we had the opportunity um, to uh, attend a, a workshop. We had somebody come from America. Mm. There was a, a big event, uh, like a, a family event, and I had to really, uh, you know, kind of, hone in on my on my deaf interpreting skills and that meant not just the signing but the tactile coping mm. strategies mm. in terms of letting somebody know that you were listening to them or with them and I really enjoyed that experience yeah. working with deaf deafblind people I would love to continue that but we definitely need more training yeah and it's just like any profession you know you need that continued mm -hmm. professional development to improve mm -hmm. your skills and it's the Absolutely. same for deaf and hearing interpreters you know when it comes to those specialized skills that we talk about like deaf interpreting yes. there's definitely the need mm. to further training there to make sure you improve Absolutely your skills need it. and again i have mentioned earlier on the importance of working together as a team mm -hmm. like i mentioned you know what i mean when working with a deaf blind a deaf blind individual and you're working with a hearing interpreter as well and ensuring that comfort ensuring right. that relationship right. knowing yeah, where to yeah. place yourself yeah, we were actually talking about that the before. importance of that um you know and talking about understanding your own role knowing yes. your hearing interpreter's role the deaf mm -hmm. interpreter's role yeah, making so sure right. you plan in advance and prepare together and actually prepare before you go into yes. that job and not preparing separately actually taking that time to prepare together beforehand mm -hmm. so you know exactly what to yes, expect yes I need to add a butt in there. Um, you know, my sister-in-law, uh, her name is Deirdre Lynch, and she works with deafblind people on a regular oh, yeah. basis, and she is highly skilled, has a really good relationship working with deafblind, and she's excellent, excellent at what she does. But there were certain things that uh, we were unaware of. She said, everybody needs training. We're not only talking about tactile hand-on-hand -hand signing, we're talking about communicating by tactile motions on the back. And can't you do arm, it on the arm? On the leg. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can. And the leg, tapping on the leg is, keep going, I'm listening to you. For a deafblind yeah. person, sometimes they may be signing, people walk away, they're like, are you still listening to me? Or is that know, someone right. still with me? By tapping them on the arm. This little kind of, you know, tickle on the arm yeah. is, I'm laughing, you're so funny. <laughs> that's you're that's them gorgeous, know that you're funny. that's funny. Yeah, but it's fascinating, the, the tap on the leg is I'm watching. But deaf blind people within Ireland understand that way of communicating. Mm. And maybe they need to understand the different tools that we use. So it's about training across the board for everybody wow. yeah. um, in order to have that relationship going forward. But yeah, you need both. Wow. And, and like I said, my sister-in-law said, yeah, we all need the training. It's so cool. Mm. Mm. It really yeah. is. Yeah. And it's so broad. You know, I think we constantly need training. There's so many opportunities for CPD going forward. Uh, yeah, it's something that's really, really crucial. I think too, it needs to be said, hearing interpreters, I don't, I don't want to feel, I don't want to, hearing interpreters to feel threatened by the presence of a deaf interpreter mm -hmm. or for that to threaten their confidence. Yeah. It's not about that. I think it's about self-awareness as well and making sure you're aware of your and own abilities, ability your you own need. skill, yeah, yeah. you know, and sometimes you do yes. need a deaf interpreter Absolutely. to work yes. alongside. Uh, no, and, and, you know, I was going to say, I think, but no, this is actually fact. Hearing interpreters absolutely will learn more mm. from working with a deaf interpreter and that works both ways yeah, right. i'm going to learn from working with you yeah. too yeah. that working relationship is so important it isn't uh, i'm better than you scenario no, no, and i suppose my plea would be <laughs> to, you know what i mean in terms of any message that you get from this podcast 
you know, there are some interpreters who feel, look, you know what, I don't need a deaf interpreter. Thanks very much. I'm going to try this on my own. That's not fair on the deaf person. It's not mm. fair on the hearing person. Right. And this is a true story. I remember in and around eight years ago, um, there was a, a specific interpreter who struggled through a, a, a psychological assessment mm. um, time and time again for about six months and it Gosh. didn't work. So the psychologist mm. looked for uh, another team and they they uh, booked a, a deaf and hearing interpreter team. We came in, the information was was received, the, the, the assessment uh, was carried out quite successfully mm. and I'm thinking there's the benefit of that and I hope going forward that people see the importance of that and just yeah. to see the, yeah. Yeah. the uh, just to be aware of the need for both this isn't again like i said about a power imbalance this is about need but i also think it comes down to hearing interpreters not knowing what deaf interpreters are because without that mm, knowing yes. and awareness we don't know that we need deaf yes. interpreters so that needs yes. to change again, a bit. the team aspect the equality aspect the learning from each other the working together absolutely and i suppose managing and navigating between those two word worlds is really important so i mean i guess the next one's a bit Easier, maybe not so easy, but what would be your top tip for interpreters or people listening? Your little pearl of wisdom for the world that you'd like to share. Be open. Oh, lovely. Just be open, be open-minded. Nice. Don't feel threatened. There is no, again, like I said, I'm going to say that phrase again. No, there's no power imbalance there. There shouldn't be. Have fun. Our job Work is together. Fun. Be yeah. honest. Be honest with each other. Mm. I really like that, that whole idea of... When you leave a job and you have that feeling of satisfaction that the two of you have worked together, you were on the same page. There are times where you may leave a job and you may, you know, rehash the 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 the, the job and, and think what happened. How could we do that better? Mm, How can mm. we ensure a smoother interpretation the next time? That is so yeah, gorgeous. That Just support. that conversation, yeah. that support, that working together. Be open. Be, be open. honest. Lovely. It's not about being better than than, than anybody. Thank oh, you so thank you, much. Thank you, thank, thank, you, thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank you again and again. I really do want to say thank you. For me, as a deaf interpreter, this is the first time really that uh, it's kind of going out into the into the public domain. I'm 30 years as a deaf yeah. interpreter, and and have been really doing it in the background. You know what I mean? On the quiet. And people think, what, what, what do we even need a deaf interpreter for? Whereas some people are quite confident and around the world, you know what I mean? You see deaf interpreters on television, whereas mm. in Ireland, we nearly do it softly, softly, quietly, mm. quietly. So I'm, I'm happy for this opportunity, for this Thank information so to go Amazing. out into the public. Amazing. <laughs> I've been Kira. I've been Romy. And you've been listening to Believe. Make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at The Lean Podcast underscore and to check out our YouTube channel, The Lean Podcast. Also, please, please, please rate and subscribe to us on Stitcher, Spotify, whatever you're listening to us on. It makes a huge difference. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.